So last time I gave the definition of a topos and I explained two of the three terms in it. So let me just write that definition out again. It's a Cartesian closed category. with all finite limits and a sub classifier. So we defined what all finite limits are, they're just limits of finite diagrams, and we defined Cartesian closed category as being a category that has binary products and a terminal object and uh, exponentials, which are bijections between the home sets uh, of So an exponential for x is just a family of objects z to the x, such that you have natural bijections between these two home sets. And one thing I didn't talk about last time, but I wanted to give an example of something that does not have exponentials, because we saw two examples of categories that do. We saw set, and then we saw the category of pre-sheaves, though I didn't go into any detail on that. But I'd like to give a non-example. So. Take C to be the category of abelian groups. And let X, let's do G and H actually. So let G and H be abelian groups. It's not too difficult to verify that you can turn the home set from G to H into an abelian group by just defining the operation addition pointwise. And so you might therefore think that maybe there would be an exponential, because if you recall, the exponential in set was just the home set. You, you pull one of the variables out and take turn into a... So z, z to the x was the set of all functions from x to z. And given a function of two variables, you turn it into a function of one variable that returns another function of one variable. But that does not work for abelian groups. And the reason that it doesn't work... Or rather... The reason, the reason that the resulting thing won't give you exponentials is because if you recall the terminal object in abelian groups is the zero group and so if you suppose that g and h were non-trivial groups and if you had an exponential for g well then a short computation leads to problems. So let's go. That's in bijection. So the, the set of group homomorphisms from H to G is in bijection with those from 0 times H to G. That's fairly clear. By the property of exponentials, we therefore have Sorry, that's not what I want to do. Zero GDH. Which is just a singleton. But that needs to hold for all groups H and G, so that's clearly ridiculous. So the only way that you're going to have an exponential for an object if that object is specifically the trivial group. All right. So with that out of the way, let's move on to sub-object classifiers. So first things first. So... Uh, sorry, so you, you gave the example, so you said the K 
category appreciates the set yes. as a rough. Yes. Does it matter if it's a billion groups in that case? No, it shouldn't. It should be for any. Well, that wouldn't work because you can't take a billion group on a single object with an identity is the category of the billion group. So. Right. At least for set C, when you want to take set C off, right, you need to have C be small for it to, everything to work. What you believe? Yeah, I would just okay. yeah. Alright. All right. So, the first thing we have to get out of the way is just a notion of injectivity for, in the language of category theory, which is what's called a monomorphism. So, a morphism in X to Y is a mono, often just called a mono, if for all g, uh, if for all f and g, which go from w to x, such that Uh, M following F is equal to M following G. We have F equals G. So that definition is basically just injectivity where you've replaced the input with just a function. And it turns out to be quite closely matched the notion of injectivity for most categories that we care about. Um, all right. Uh, something I alluded to last time was that we were going to want to talk about sub-objects of objects within a category C. And just like the problem we have with limits, which turns out to not be a problem, but just like the, pro the, the seeming, seemingly the problem we were going to have is that you can't talk about the elements of objects. You can only frame such definitions in terms of objects and morphisms themselves because that's all the category can actually see. <coughs> So we need to figure out how to define sub-objects, which only talks about objects and morphisms. So let's do that. So let x be an element of a category. Define equivalence. On, so we define an equivalence relation on all monomorphisms into X where, so let's say we have M which goes from S to X and let's say we have M prime uh, M prime goes from S prime to X prime. No, sorry, from S prime to X. So if we have two such monomorphisms, where we say that M is equivalent to M prime if there exists F from S to S prime, an isomorphism. Such that uh, so what do we want? We want uh, S from S prime. So M is equal to M prime followed by F. That's right. So the, intu in the intuition behind this definition is it's the familiar abuse that we do where we identify subsets with injective maps. But we have to then take an equivalence relation because we want to ensure that, for example, let's say you've got, uh, let me do it up here. Let's say you have, X to have two elements. One, two. Well, 
And let's say you want to pick out the solid bubble object, object that just has the element 1. Well, you could take an injective map that goes from A into X, which sends A to 1. And then you could also take, for example, an injective function that goes from B to X, which also picks out the element 1. And if you didn't take an equivalence relation on all the monomorphisms, you would say that these were two different subobjects. But you don't want them to be, because they're referring to the same one element subset. So you basically have to identify any two monomorphisms if their domains are isomorphic and there's a way to get from one to the other that picks out the same elements, basically. I should probably actually write that that's what I... Uh, Subobject is just an equivalence class. Of monomorphisms. Tedious question. <laughs> the collection of monomorphisms into an object need not be a set, right? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's reasonable. Uh, in every topos it is. Is it? How do you prove that? Let's uh, discuss it later. Okay. It'll take a little while to explain. In general, you do have to worry about it. It's called powered. That's right, yeah. So, well powered. Such that the collection of subordinates is a set. It's called well powered. Well, actually, after James states the next proposition, Exercise the use that any two boxes will have. We should be able to do that in the next proposition. Well, the next thing is the definition, right? And then it's. Okay, so with that out of the way, we can now talk about sublogic classifiers. So let C have all finite limits. In particular, that includes a terminal object, which we're going to need, and it includes pullbacks, which we're also going to need. Okay. Subobject classifier. is an object, omega, and a monomorphism, which is usually called true, which goes from the terminal object to omega. Note that the terminal object that the terminal object doesn't know about morphisms that come out of it. it only, the only thing that the definition of a terminal object cares about is morphisms that go into it, of which there's exactly one. So this isn't just a trivial statement. Um, such that for each monomorphism. For each monomorphism between two objects, there exists a unique map, which I'll call chi of m, which goes from x to omega, such that the following square is a pullback. Here. 
This is the unique map that goes from S into 1, which is guaranteed to exist by the definition of a terminal object. Um, this is x. This map's m. This map here is chi of m. This map here is true. As usual, if it exists, oh, I should be more specific. If if the subobject classifier exists, so if omega true exists, it's unique up to unique isomorphism. So, to sort of give some intuition as to what this definition is actually saying, let me state the next proposition and then I'll elaborate a little bit. Because the next proposition makes it a little bit more clear as well. Proposition. Let's see. Be small. Do I have to have seen that? No, just small home sets. And C has a sub object classifier. If and only if there exists an object, omega, such that we have natural objections. Set of all sub objects and the set of homomorphisms from X into Mega. So it's sub is just the set of all sub objects of X. I should say for all X. So to come back to what Sam said briefly, sort of interrupt, but so this, the, if you take sub objects of a fixed object, Generically, that's a class. So the proposition is saying that uh, there exists an omega such that for all x, first of all, there's a bijection between the set on the right and the class on the left. So obviously, it's a small class, so it might as well pretend it's a set. So as a consequence of the existence of a subobject classifier, then a topos is not bad. What is a small home set? It just means it's a. It's a home, the, the set of the collection of all homomorphisms is a set, right? For any pair of objects. Yeah. Well, I guess you could just take this collection of all homomorphisms, period. I don't care about any categories that don't have small <laughs> home sets. That's ridiculous. So I still don't understand. I think it's just a path on this condition. Um, okay, so now to give some intuition on what this is actually saying. So, M is our subobject, or the inclusion of S into X is our subobject. And what the map chi M you should think of is like the characteristic function of that subobject. So, in the very simple case of set, which we'll go into 
quite short, uh, shortly. This is just a set of truth values, zero and one. And we define, we're going to define chi m as literally the characteristic function. So it has value one exactly if we're talking about an object in x, an element of x that is also actually in s. And it's not too difficult to see for sets, or it's, it's maybe slightly more difficult to prove, but it's, it's not difficult to intuit why it might be true that characteristic functions are necessarily in uh, natural bijection with the um, subobjects. But it's really not that hard to prove, <laughs> at least for sets. Uh, let's just go up to another board. Actually, keep this just with the timing. So, so let's take C as set. Then the terminal object in sets is just a singleton. Define omega to just be the set that has zero and one, and true, which goes from a singleton to zero one, is just going to send this guy to one. Let M be a monomorphism. I'm going to assume, just because it makes the notation a little easier to write down, that S is a subset of X and M is actually the inclusion. goes from x to omega as so given an element x of x we find it to be zero if x is not in s and one if x is in s. It turns out that this will be exactly the suborbital classifier that we're looking for. So let's go about proving that. Diagram. I'm just going to draw it small. So let's do it as omega. That's true. That's uh, I have m. That's m. Is a pullback square. commutes uh, actually so for so for any s in s 
we have uh, I have M circ M S. Well, this is just the inclusion. So this is the chi of m of s, which is just 1 by definition. But then that's always what the value of true is going to be. So the diagram commutes. So say it is universal. We have a diagram as follows. So, uh, x mega one. That arrow is obviously fixed. That arrow is fixed. This arrow is m. This arrow is chi of m. This arrow is true. And this is some other arrow that we're specifying. So let's just call it f. I should say commuting diagram. <laughs> well, the fact that this diagram commutes tells you that any element of t must evaluate to 1 along this edge. And so therefore, it must also evaluate to 1 when you go along this edge or these edges. So then we have chi of m f of t is equal to 1 for all t and t. So Therefore, the image of t is a subset of s. Hence, we have a factorization. Oh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, therefore, we have a factorization. And it's also not very difficult to see that it must be unique. Hence. Claim to chi m is the unique map that makes it a pullback square. So proof. Suppose phi going from x to omega also gave a pullback square. Mega one. Just 
true. Uh, this map is now fire, and this map is still M. So it's not too difficult to see, therefore, must have uh, phi s equals one of each s in s. That's just by virtue of the fact that that square commutes. And again, I'm not bothering to write m because it's just the inclusion. So what we need to show that phi of x equals 0 if x is in x but not s. So suppose that phi of x equals 1. And consider the diagram So up here we've just got the singleton, which just contains x. And we have s, x, 1, and omega. This is phi. This is m. It's just the obvious thing. This is true. And just take this to be the inclusion. So if we take it to be the inclusion, then the reason that this diagram commutes is precisely because of this condition. Since phi of x is equal to 1, this diagram commutes. So by the universal property, back there exists a unique factorization theta which goes from x to s such that I should actually give the inclusion map a name so I'm just going to call it i so such that i is equal to m after theta. But if you think about what that condition says, thus theta x has to be equal to x, because that's what the, this is the inclusion, this is the inclusion. But then that immediately tells you that x must be an s, which is only possible. is in S. Therefore, uh, phi must be equal to chi m. Because we've shown that it has value 0 on all the things that aren't in S, and I've shown that it has value 1 on all the things that are S, and that's exactly what chi m is.
Any questions? All right. I think it's on to the next example now. Yep. So next is a sort of slightly more interesting example of a topos than set. So. Denoted set to the n, be the category with objects being all sequences of sets and functions. X naught, sigma naught, X one, sigma one, X two, sigma two. So the objects are all such sequences. Um, usually when I write them out, I probably won't bother to put the subscript on the sigmas because it's usually clear from context which, which arrow it must be. The morphisms. in set to the n are uh, collections of functions I should actually say a morphism that's made it worse a morphism prime a morphism is a collection of functions uh, fi which goes from xi to xi prime such that the following commutes In particular, such a morphism is a monomorphism if each of these arrows, f, are monomorphisms. And at least for when I describe the subobject class array, I'm just going to assume that they're all inclusions because it makes it a lot easier. Implicitly, that uh, monomorphisms are precisely things for which each fi is injective. Yeah. So easy to see, but just so everybody's aware that that's uh, a point that. I mean, it seems like whenever in, in, in category theory, it's always epimorphisms that are broken ones. Monomorphisms are always <laughs> injectives. <laughs> At least for ev basically every category I've seen. Uh, yes. Okay. 
So actually, I do want to flag this in particular. If each fi is an inclusion, uh, xi is a subset of xi prime, then commutivity says that sigma applied to S I, uh, sorry, not S I, uh, X I is a subset of X I plus one. That's just exactly what those squares commuting means. All right. Well, okay, and sigma equals sigma prime, because that will also follow from that condition, right? Yeah. Okay, so. It's easy to see that one, that this category has a terminal object, and it's just the sequence of singletons with the only arrows possible. So the claim is, uh, actually let me, let's just define omega as the following sequence. Let me actually say. So whenever I write n bar, it's just the set in union infinity. And also I'm taking the convention that in the natural numbers contain zero. of functions which are all the same. I'm going to define omega of n to be equal to 0 if n equals 0. It's equal to infinity if n is equal to infinity. It's equal to n minus 1 otherwise. In other words, omega is just a predecessor. Given a mono uh, M So I suppose we're given a monomorphism from S to X. Again, for convenience. H M I is the inclusion. Define chi, which goes from x to omega. I'm not going to have a subscript on the chi because that's going to get confusing when I'm then trying to name each of its components. So define chi as or as having components. chi i, which goes from uh, x i to omega i, which is just n bar. Given by the following. So chi i x i is equal to the minimum natural number such that a 
applying sigma to the in to xi gives you something in s, specifically si plus n. So if you look at this diagram, imagine these are s's and these are x's. If you pick an element in here, a natural question to ask is, how long can you go to the right before you are forced to be included in the subsets that we've picked out? And that's exactly what this function measures. Of course, there's no guarantee that such an n will exist. So if such n exists, and if such n doesn't exist, we just define it to be infinity. Something that is worth checking, and I'll actually bring the other one down in a second and check it, is that that's actually a morphism, because it's not immediately obvious. Si in Si, we have uh, let's see what it means actually. So chi i, make sure I have this right. Chi i plus one. Sigma of Si. Well, Sigma of Si is still going to be in the top row because of this property, which I just rubbed off. The property that says that Sigma, sigma applied to Si is a subset of Si plus 1. So that's also going to be equal to 0, right? Because it's still in the top row, and that's what this checks. But then that's also equal to omega of chi i applied to si. And that's exactly the condition we need for it to be a morphism. We're not done, though, because we also have to check that it works for all the ones that weren't in si. If xi is in xi but not in si, then chi of i plus 1 circ uh, sigma uh, sigma si okay, right, thanks sigma xi well that's equal to the minimum such that sigma of xi gets pushed into s that's the minimum in in n such that sigma to the n plus one x i is in s n plus i plus one. But then that's further equal to the minimum of n such that sigma to the n xi is in Sn plus i minus 1, which is equal to omega of xi si, uh, xi s, xi, xi, there we go. 
So, yeah, I mean, sorry, sorry, Sam. Um, are you using the opposite conventions here from the previous example? So it seems like if Si is an Si, then chi of that is zero. Yes, that's right. Right, so it's So the sort of intuitive understanding of what chi is doing is measuring the time before you end up in Si. Right. Yep. So, oh, that's fine. so it's zero. It's going to be some natural number, but if, if it is in SI, then it's going to be zero, which is, yeah, flip it around. At least the way the book... True is zero. Yeah. At least the way the book does it, they, they have, in the earlier example with sets, they have zero being the value true, which I just find insane, so I didn't do it that way. James, the, um, in the set on the right-hand side of that first one, the last one, mm -hmm. Because we've because this measures the minimum n such that this element here is in S. But this element here has an extra sigma. So that's where the one's coming from. So if you were to write it out properly, it's the minimum n such that sigma to the n of sigma xi okay. is in there. Yeah. Alright. So claim one again. I gives a pullback square. I won't bother writing out square. But. Uh, as in the defin of a sub object of sub object classifies. How long can I go for? Because I'm going to run out of time, I would much rather do claim two than claim one. Claim, claim one is essentially the same as claim one from the last one. It's not terribly difficult, it's just sort of unpacking what equality of functions means in this. It's, it means that they agree on all components. And so you just have to, essentially you get a pullback square per component and then you just check that it works. And it's basically the same as in set. Claim two. Chi is unique with this property. Oh, I didn't spell what true was. True is just the thing that sends everything to zero. I guess, actually, you flagged that, so yeah, it's fine. Uh, uh, no, this is phi now. And this is just the inclusion. I guess I'll call it in. OK, so if that's a pullback square, since, since the square commutes, For any SI in SI, we have phi i of SI is equal to zero. Because that's what commutivity of that diagram says. So you get a diagram like this for every single one of the components, and then you just evaluate that when it agrees with true. Okay. Now, suppose xi is an element of xi.
let n in n be minimal such that sigma to the n xi is in s n plus i. Uh, at least for convenience right now, I'm assuming that it's finite. The proof will actually work equally well once it's infinite, but let's just assume that it's finite. So if we're assuming that's finite, what we're trying to show that phi i of xi is equal to n. So is it less than or equal to this? Yeah, less than or equal to it. Okay. So less than or equal to is the easy, easy direction. So we know by this property that phi i plus n of sigma to the n applied to xi equals 0. Because by hypothesis, this is in Sn plus i. And that's what that condition says. But by commutivity of, uh, by, the, by the fact that this is a morphism, we know that we can push this sigma through and turn it into an omega. So this is equal to omega to the n of phi i of xi. But then by definition of omega, omega de decrements its input by at most one at each step. So therefore, that implies that phi i of xi must be less than or equal to n. Because if you apply omega n times, you can only decrease by at most n and we get to zero, so therefore it must be less than n. All right, so what about the other inequality? So let's define the value k to be whatever the value of phi of i of xi is. We're trying to show that k is equal to n, or more specifically, that it's greater than or equal to n. Find a sequence, which I'm going to call T, which starts with the empty set, it goes to the empty set, keeps doing that for a while, goes to the empty set, then it goes to sigma to the k xi, and it goes from sigma to the k plus 1 xi. And then it keeps doing that forever. And specifically, we have k plus i copies of the empty set here. Well, then we have an inclusion into x naught, inclusion into x one, this is x k plus i minus one. are all sigma. This is xk. Sigma. This is xk plus, sorry, k plus i. Uh, this is sigma. This is xk plus i plus 1. 
forever. So this diagram commutes. It's easy to see that these squares commute because you don't have to check anything. And then these squares commute simply because this map is sigma restricted to the one element subset. Uh, let's call this map i. So this is i naught. Actually, no, let's not use i because I'm already using i. Let's use uh, g. g naught, g1, etc. Then g, which goes from t to x, is a morphism. In, so it's the n. Furthermore, the following commutes. So it's just the usual diagram. We have T here. We have S here. That's one. That's one. Uh, this is X. This is omega. This is phi. This is whatever we named it. This is true. This is G. It's not totally obvious that that commutes, right? Because we need to ensure that any value in T evaluates to zero. So why does that happen? It's because uh, so sigma. Sigma to the k xi, well, that is equal to omega to the k phi i of xi, which is equal to omega to the k of k, because we define k to have that value, which is 0. And that's exactly the condition we need for this diagram to commute, right? And it's also the reason why we had all these empty sets at the start. We needed those empty sets to be there because otherwise the diagram wouldn't commute. But once we get to sigma to the k xi, we're fine because we know that it's going to be zero. So that's why, that's why we define the sequence that we do. OK. So by the universal property. There exists a theta that goes from t to s, such that theta, I do actually need to give this a name, so let's call it m. So m following theta equals g. In particular, They're going to agree on the k plus i component. So we're going to have m k plus i followed by theta, or following theta k plus i is equal to g k plus i. Well, what is theta k plus i? Oh, sorry, what is g k plus i is this map here, and it's just the inclusion.
theta k plus i, it goes from the set sigma k plus i, uh, sorry, sigma k x i, and it goes into the set uh, s i, or may as well have it go into x i. <laughs> no, let's do s i. Uh, k plus i, yeah, thanks. <laughs> s k plus i. Well, what does that satisfy? Well, by this condition, it must satisfy theta k plus i, sigma of the k, x i, is equal to sigma of the k, x i. But that's only possible if this is in s k plus i. But if sigma of the k x i is in s k plus i, then by the minimality condition, which I think was on this board before, k must be greater than or equal to n by minimality. Hence, k equals n. Actually, this is not even right k. Let's just write phi i x i. Uh. So phi i x i is equal to n, and that's exactly what the value of chi So we're done. We've shown that phi is equal to chi. Uh, one other comment I should make is you might object that in doing this, I assumed that n was finite. And also, when I define this diagram, I assumed that k was finite. But if you actually track what this proof is doing, it shows that if n is finite, then k must be less than or equal to n. And if n is finite, then k must be less than or equal to uh, k must be, sorry, if k, if k is finite, then n must be less than or equal to k. And so once you have that, you therefore know that if you, either one is infinity, the other one must also be infinity. Cool. Uh, that's about all I have to say about this. So I think probably I'll just give the definition of topos again and then end. Cool. So uh, definition of topos. Oh wait, no, there was one other example I wanted to do. I wanted to do a billion groups. Let me actually do that. It's more interesting anyway. <laughs> Well, the main reason for setting the definition again is to do the uh, alternate definition. I guess I can just write that down without bothering to rewrite it. All right. So, again, the category of abelian groups provides a non example of sub classifiers. Suppose the category of abelian groups had a sub-object classifier. Well, 
let G be a group or ambulant group. And consider, make sure I get, yeah, that's right. Chi as the characteristic characteristic map of the zero map. Zero monomorphism. So this arrow here. Uh, the terminal object in abelian groups is just the zero group as well. Uh, our group G is here. This is our map zero. This map is also zero. The map true must also be zero because of the fact that this is the zero group and the only map coming out of the zero group is zero. And this is the characteristic map that we're claiming exists by definition of sub-object classifier. Well, if you pull back along zero, that's just equal to the pre-image. You pull back. Along zero is the pre-image. So this must be equal to the pre-image of zero along that map, uh, corresponding to that map rather, is the pre-image. So and since it's zero, we therefore have that chi is, in, is injective. But that immediately runs into problem due to cardinality reasons, because that implies that the arbitrary group G embeds into Omega. And that needs to hold for all groups G. And that's just not possible, because you can construct a group of any cardinality you like, which means this group needs to have a cardinality of greater cardinality than all cardinalities, which is impossible. that every group G embeds into Omega. Cool. All right, that's it. <laughs> Questions?